making very short speeches, and I promise, I promise. I'd like to first welcome you to the Pew Charitable Trust. My name is Sue Lieberman, and I'm Director of International Policy with the... You don't have to clap. Thank you. Um, I, I, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we're delighted there to see so many of you here this evening, to meet Paul Greenberg and to hear more about his book, and to engage in conversation about the future of wild fish. Just a few words, I promise. The Pew Environment Group is the conservation arm of the Pew Charitable Trusts. We're working to save the natural environment and protect the rich array of life it supports. And critical to that work is the future of our planet's rich marine biodiversity. For the oceans, we're focused on promoting the adoption of strong environmental policies at the national and international levels. And critical to that is stopping the scourge of overfishing, one of the most serious threats to ocean life today, <clears throat> causing massive destruction and declines in fish populations. Something must be done. The oceans, after all, are not endless. Paul Greenberg's book is a chilling call to action as to what our species has done to populations of wild fish in our oceans, focused on cod, sea bass, tuna, and salmon, and we want there to be wild fish in his or her future as well. We have done scientific and advocacy work on all these species, and our particular focus right now is the Atlantic bluefin tuna that you're going to hear about. I spoke with Paul during the CITES meeting uh, last March in Doha, when I was in Doha, where some governments, including Monaco, the U.S., Norway, and others, supported a ban on international trade in the species until it recovers, and you can read about that more in his book. Sadly, the forces of economic expediency prevailed at the meeting over the voices of science and conservation. But we won't give up. None of us here can give up on the ocean. And we're now calling on governments to put a halt to all fishing of this magnificent species on its only known spawning breeding grounds in the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean. We can talk about this later. But again, we would like the Pew Environment Group would like to thank Paul for his book and for all of his work on these issues. I would like, now like to introduce Andrew Light, who is a senior fellow with Science Progress and director of international climate policy at the Center for American Progress. Thank you very much. I'm going to be uh, very brief because uh, I'm going to hear, hear from Paul as quickly as possible. Um, um, I'm very happy to represent Science Progress uh, here at the meeting in the Center for American Progress, and we're very happy to be a co-sponsor of this event. Um, Science Progress is an online uh, journal um, and a project of the Center for American Progress. Um, it covers a array of issues, array of issues in science uh, policy, but we are recently decided at the Center for American Progress to start a concentrated set of work in a new research program in ocean policy. And so, when we were offered the opportunity to co-sponsor this event on Paul's magnificent book, we, we jumped at it. Um, if you'd like to know more about the kind of work we're doing, please go to Science Progress website, where the first thing you'll see is an, is an extended interview that I did with, with Paul just last week, which we hope goes into a little bit more detail on the science of these issues than you might find in some other venues. Um, in addition to the work that we're going to be doing on ocean policy, also I'm happy to announce that our president and founder, John Podesta, has now become a commissioner for the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative. Um, and so we'll be working um, with a number of organizations I know who are represented here who also have uh, commissioners in the, same, uh, in the same group on the future of ocean policy, building out from the executive order that President Obama just signed last month. Um, the only thing I want to say about, about Paul's book is this. Um, I spent my career working in land use and, and climate policy, uh, prairie restoration and sort of stuff like that, but um, I was fortunate enough to marry someone who was writing a book on sharks, not out yet, but soon to be out next spring, and so she drug me around the, the world for two years while she was reporting out on, on sharks. And I met uh, more marine biologists than I care to talk about right now, um, but, but really uh, learned in, in an up-close fashion um, the amazing scope of the problem that we face with respect to fisheries, with respect to ocean issues in general, um, which I'm sure all of you are well aware of. And I'm absolutely and utterly convinced um, that the only way we're ever going to mobilize the kind of attention that's needed on this issue, the kind of public awareness on an issue that the public impacts every single day and does not realize, and to get our policymakers to go in the directions that need to go so that America really does begin to show leadership on this issue, um, is by telling the kinds of scientifically informed and engaged narratives 
that Paul does in this book. So congratulations, Paul, on an exceptional achievement, and thank you again very much for coming. Thank you. I'll now introduce James Fawn, who has been the director of the Internews Earth Journalism Network since 2004. James was previously an award-winning journalist based in Thailand, where he covered environmental issues for a local newspaper and TV station, as well as international publications, and he's the author of a book about the issues he covered and his adventures there called The Land on Fire. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction, and I promise I'm the last speaker before it falls, so please bear with me. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us tonight as well. On behalf of Internews, it's really an honor to be here to celebrate with Paul his wonderful new book, For a Fish, the result of a decade's worth of research and a lifetime's passion for fisheries. Uh, we're proud to say that Paul used to work with Internews. He was a director of media training in our early days and led, led many of our programs in Russia and the Balkans. Uh, before leaving, he, he went on to write a novel called Leaving Katya before starting his current work. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Inch News, we're a 28-year-old media development organization that supports uh, a free and open press around the world. So we've worked with, in over 70 countries, training over 80,000 journalists and everything from basic journalism to health journalism to, of course, environmental journalism. I head up our environmental program for a project called the Earth Journalism Network. We support journalists around the world. We work with over a thousand journalists to help them cover environmental issues. We'll do everything from training them in technical skills on issues such as oceans, marine resources, uh, providing them fellowships to attend major conferences, and helping them produce new content. Just Today, we announced that we're bringing at least 30 developing country journalists to the COP15 Climate Summit in Mexico later this year. And this year, for the first time ever, we're also going to bring a handful of American journalists because it seems to us that the U.S. media could also stand in <laughs> this country. You might say what we're trying to do is duplicate Paul's success um, by working with local journalists and, and communities around the world. And that's important because, as you all know, uh, environmental issues are global in nature, and as Paul and I were discussing beforehand, many of uh, the fate of many of the world's fisheries are going to be decided in the developing world. So we really need to help journalists get the story right, and that story changes from place to place. Uh, in many of the tropical countries we work in, the largest aquaculture issue being faced is actually shrimp farming. And perhaps some of you are, have experienced this, that we've seen shrimp farming decimate entire coastlines in, in many developing countries, uh, even while it meets the world's increasing demand for seafood. So I think many of the same issues that Paul's identified in regard to salmon farming uh, and the same ambiguities can also be found with shrimp farming. I think journalism is helping to reform that industry, hopefully before it's too late. Um, in the meantime, uh, we've seen a lot of other direct impacts that journalism has done. They've helped protect national parks, helped uncover illegally polluting factories. We've worked with journalists to un uncover wildlife smuggling rings. So there's a lot going on, and there could be a lot more going on. And before I turn it over to Paul, just one last thing I want you to think about. What if we had a hundred, hundreds, maybe thousands of Paul Greenbergs out there around the world covering <laughs> these environmental Global issues? Neurosis. I know, it's a scary thought. <laughs> Covering these environmental issues for local media and local languages, I think, can make a world of difference. So, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Please take the word. Thank you. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I, in a way, I feel a little bit like a salmon in that I, you know, I went out to sea and I swam back upstream, and I, and I see so many people that started this book project in the first place. Um, so, it's actually, I feel, I feel like I'm, I'm home uh, to some degree, although my uh, long-suffering partner and my three-year-old wouldn't feel that way. Um, <laughs> Anyway, just before I kind of go into about the book, I um, uh, want a big shout out and big thanks to the Pew Environment Group. Um, if you're a reporter, and uh, you know, as, as I have been a reporter, but also been a journalism trainer uh, in the former Soviet Union, um, you uh, you always try to get multiple sources on a story. You try not to you know form your thesis and then you know fill it backfill with made up facts. 
But one of the problems with the Pew Environment Group is that no matter where you turn in fisheries, you keep finding the Pew Environment Group. It's just such an omnipresent, powerful force for good in the world of fisheries. Um, and if it weren't there, I, I think there'd just be a huge vacuum. So in particular, thanks to, to Sue Lieberman and the great source on my uh, Tuna Zen story that I did for the Times. Uh, Julie Roberson is recently with you that I've known uh, since the Sea Web days and her great work on the Seafood Summit. I also say to Vicki Spruill, who's here, who, uh, for any of you who know her, she's sort of like the, the grand dame of, of uh, seafood choosing and <laughs> wonderful, wonderful person. Also to Kimberly Escobar, uh, whose great, great work on putting this whole thing together has been just amazing. Um, thanks to the Center for American Progress, uh, Center, Center for American Progress, the Science Progress, and Andrew Light, who did a great, great interview uh, with me. It was the most informed interview that's been taken so far, so I really appreciate that. Um, and, and lastly, to the Earth Journalism Network and Internews, as I said, I did. I was sort of the person who set up the media uh, training programs uh, for interviews in the first place in the early 90s, and then eventually in Bosnia just after the war. Um, but what I, you know, I think um, something James was saying is really true. Without environmental reporters, there's not really going to be an environment. Um, has anybody here from the Pacific Northwest? Right. So you know those beauty corridors that they do when they log uh, a timber sale? Like I, I sort of cut my teeth on fisheries biology doing salmon counting in Oregon. And they leave these beauty corridors of these huge Douglas fir trees along the, you know, along the highway. And if you're just sort of driving along in your Winnebago, you're like, oh, there's a great forest here, you know? But if you, <laughs> if you, however, were to get out of your Winnebago and kind of step out and go beyond the beauty corridor, what you'd see is stumps and stumps and stumps. And it's really, you know, it's, it's those independent journalists, it's those people who aren't afraid to offend authority. Uh, that are the ones that are doing that. And um, it's funny, I've been using that analogy also a lot about fishermen. Um, you know, if we didn't have fishermen out there, and I don't want to ever come off as being anti-fishing, because we need fishing to be those same people who get out of their Winnebago and go beyond the beauty corridor and look at what's really going on in the ocean. If we didn't have fishermen, we wouldn't have people looking at what the state of fisheries was on a daily basis. So, plug out and a, and a, and a, and a, and a shout out to the fishermen as well. Um, also, thanks to Celeste LaRue, um, Andrew, Andrew Good. Gouda. Gouda. Gouda, sorry, I'm sorry for mispronouncing. And of course, um, to, to James and um, Jerry Curry, thank you so much for putting together. And also, there's a name on this list that got crossed out, um, and it's, it's Anthony Garrett's name. And, um, it shows you the sort of, and he, he crossed it out, actually, uh, which shows you his sort of incredible modesty as a person who really is a mover and shaker in the best of ways. So, you know, here's another person who, uh, you know, keeps our beauty corridors deep. So, thank you to you, Anthony. So,